while somebody is thinking about breaking that ice, and I know somebody in this auditorium can do that this afternoon, uh, I might go first. Ken Ash, I was heartened to hear that um, your view is somewhat more optimistic than some of the news that we've heard from ABES this morning, and I'm sure um, Australian farmers would be very pleased to hear you say that, sir. Uh, you were talking about the need for policies to align with new market realities. Um, you talked a little bit about increasing trade openness, but uh, significantly also about increasing investment in innovation, which I think is probably something that also resonates in this country where uh, a strong message has been going from agriculture to government that this is fundamentally important. Could, would you like to speak further to that? Um, essentially to agree. Um, we've done a lot of work uh, at OECD with, with FAO and, and, and lots of other international organizations trying to identify practical things that, that governments can do to, to respond to relatively strong demand conditions. And I think the single thing that every international organization that's in this business and every government that we've spoken to about this issue would agree on is the need to improve agricultural productivity growth, to the, the basic need to use available land, water, biodiversity resources more efficiently than we've done in the past. And it's about incentives and disincentives. It's, it's about aligning the, 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 the effort, the priority, the, the focus of government in part on that new productivity challenge. And it's about better connecting with the private sector. I mean, we didn't talk much about the, 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 the amount of investment that, that's needed, but there, is not enough, there's, there isn't enough public money in this world to generate the kinds of supply responses that we're going to need. It's going to have to um, be a, 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 an exercise that, that also attracts private capital much more so than, than has been the, the case to date. And again, this, this is where I think these framework conditions become so very, very important. And, and David Hallam, that seemed to pick up on a point that you mentioned in your presentation as well. Can you expand on that? Um, yeah, sure. The, um, I, th I think, in fact, Ken has said it all, but uh, more or less. Um, the, um, we estimated um, in one of our recent studies that um, in, again, in order to uh, feed the, the world by 2050, um, you needed something in excess of $80 billion uh, additional investment per year uh, in um, food and uh, agriculture and, and downstream uh, issues. Now, if you look at the history of, of the last couple of decades, I guess, what you've seen is very low levels of agricultural investment. And, and so if you start looking at where is, you know, where would m more than 80 billion a year come from? You look, and, and in the case of developing countries especially, we've seen um, the share of official development assistance going into agriculture. Uh, declining. It's, it's, it's picked up a little now, but at, at one point a few years back, it, it was something like 4%. Um, in developing countries, um, commercial bank lending to agriculture is, is also often limited. It's a high-risk uh, investment. And so um, you're confined, uh, you know, some of the, the places you would normally look to uh, for these investment funds um, and, and not very promising. And this, is, this brings me to one of the, the, the points that I, I did mean to make and which is an, an issue of, of some concern um, in Australia as well, which is, you know, what is the contribution that uh, foreign direct investment can make? In, in this uh, in expanding productivity and, and so on. Uh, it's a very controversial area, especially in developing countries, but I, I know from an interview I did this morning with, with ABC that um, it's a very controversial issue here in Australia as well. And, um, but no one 
is going to invest unless the, the incentives and the conditions are there to make them confident that they will actually get a return. Mm -hmm. and, and this puts us, you know, as, again, as, as Ken said, uh, um, into a, 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 an important role for governments um, and to make sure that those uh, conditions are present. Thank you, David. There are a couple of questions from the floor. I might start with this gentleman on my right. Peter Rowe from CSPP. Yeah. Uh, microphone on, please. Can you hear me now? You might have to speak up in a big, loud voice. Peter Rowe from CSPP. Probably a question for Jamie and possibly David. Right at the beginning of your talk, you talked more about the... Thank you. You talked more about the price outlook being no real net increase in prices. And then we've seen over the last few years the dramatic increase in volatility as global grain stocks have, have fallen off. And I'm just wanting you to expand a little bit more in your price estimates how you built volatility in and how you see that impacting on price changes over time. Sure. Um, Perhaps I can answer that question uh, together with Lee's comments in terms of uh, whether ABS projection uh, of price movements to 2050, whether it's optimistic or pessimistic. I think, say, uh, if you look at uh, uh, what happened over the past few years, uh, higher prices uh, uh, for agriculture products reflect climate uh, volatility uh, that happened around the world, also including in Australia. I gave you two examples. We have seen quite a significant increase in uh, wheat coarse grain prices because of drought in the U.S. and also <coughs> adverse seasonal conditions in the Black Sea area. Now, uh, if you think in terms of uh, uh, the median term projections, I think the, for any forecaster, the major issue is that how can you factor in this uh, climate variability and then price volatility into your central uh, scenario? It's almost uh, uh, very difficult and, and almost impossible. So what we have uh, present in terms of our medium term and longer term projection, it's really a central scenario that we assume that the uh, seasonal condition will be relatively favorable. Now, if someone has a different view, think, say, okay, draw will continue to happen in major producing countries, and every year in Australia, we will be experiencing like what we experienced over the past two seasons, that rainfall all came at the right time, significant amount, huge irrigation waters be available, then naturally the picture could be very different than what we are projecting. But I wouldn't say that's a central scenario. That's really the volatility associated with the projection. And we try to handle that issue by doing sensitivity analysis. And as you can, can see from my presentation, that once we change some of the assumptions, price movements, especially associated with rainfall deficiency, that we actually had a 22% increase uh, in prices. So uh, back to Lee's comment, well, I agree with Ken and David, they are just uh, uh, not only policy measures for agriculture, but the border economy that will impact on productivity growth. Mm. So I don't think, say, we actually have any disagreements in terms of the central scenario field uh, for the future. But the issue is that if we can reach better than we expected now, then the outcome for prices and production will be different than the central scenario uh, you know, uh, that is produced based on currently available information. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Lunch is not far away, but we have one question up the back, please. And I was going to ask two. Uh, I'll try and stick them both in. The first one for David Haddam. Uh, one of your graphs had the uh, roots, tuber, and plantains with a very large discrepancy in either price or productivity potential. I can't remember which. Um, 
what could you please explain that and whether you see there being pressure to shift to cereals as an alternative production system in what can be very dry climates? Um, and then the second question, ro what role innovation, uh, given the barriers to adoption that you were talking about in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia? David, first question first. Um, <coughs> yeah, um, what that, um, th that particular um, graph was showing, I, I think, was the, uh, it was reflecting uh, very much on, but not entirely on the sub-Saharan African uh, uh, case where uh, roots, tubers, and plantains are an important part of, um, of, of calorie supplies and um, and also what we've seen in in recent uh, years is some movement um, not just in sub-saharan Africa but also elsewhere notably in the Pacific region of uh, movements back towards um, these more traditional uh, contribu contributors to the to household diets and um, so that's uh, uh, um, uh, and away from uh, cereals, often, often imported cereals. So, um, so that's that's is a, a substitution effect, as, as you've suggested. Yeah. Uh, and Ken, did you want to come in on, on that second question at all? I thought it was a question for David on sub-Saharan Africa, but yep. uh, in in. Um, I think the, 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 the issue in, in less developed countries in many, many cases, it, it's, not about, it's not about science and tech, it's about changing practices. And, and people do things for good reasons. They do things to, 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 um, to, to, to manage um, variable output levels on the basis of past experiences. So they use the whole variety, for example, of relatively inefficient uh, seeds because they know that they're going to get something as opposed to a maximum output. So it's, it, it's not at all a simple matter. Um, I think the, the, the importance of, uh, if I could do one thing, I think I would focus a, an awful lot more on, the, on, on extension services and advisory services and passing along know-how and skills mm. uh, to, to very, very small firms uh, to, to try and, and generate uh, better, more modern not because they're more modern, because they're more productive uh, practices. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, there, isn't a single, there isn't a single simple answer, but I, if I have to give you one thing, that's where I would put my, my nickel. Thank you very much, Ken. Now, lunch is upon us. So, ladies and gentlemen, could you th please thank our speakers this morning, Jamie Penn, David Hallam, and Ken Ash.